you have your Bibles, you can turn right there to 1 John chapter 1, or we'll have it up on the screen behind us. This is verse 5. This is the message that we heard from him, and we proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray. God, we just come to you this morning. Our hearts are open, our ears are open. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate your word so that we might truly understand who you are, who we are. God, we trust your word when it says that it won't return void. And so today, as we study it, as we look upon it, as we apply it to our lives, we just ask that you would reveal in us what it is that you want us to learn, how it is that you want us to change, what it is that you want us to come face to face with. Lord, we are so good at just running away from inconvenient truths. We're so good at running away from things that are hard. I pray that today, God, we would be confronted with your truth, knowing that it's truth spoken in love from a father who is good. We love you. We ask that you would be with us here today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I got a question for us today. Do you think that it's possible to repeat a lie so many times that you actually start to believe that it's true? Now, there's, I read some studies on this. There's some psychology, like some psychology studies that show that this is actually true. The more often that you repeat a lie to yourself, the more likely you are to actually believe that that's true. There's this famous, uh, infamous is a better way of saying it, a man named Joseph Goebbels. He was the Nazi propaganda minister, and he kind of famously said something along these lines. You just have to repeat a lie that's big enough and enough times, and eventually it becomes true. And the studies sort of show that that's, that's the case. Now, all of us lie. At some point in our life, you lie. If you told me you never lied, well, there you lied. I've come across people who are just... It's, it's the weirdest thing to me. They're just habitual liars. I don't know if you've ever run into somebody like this. They just, they'll lie about stuff that there's no reason to lie about it. Makes no sense. I, on the, I'm a terrible liar. I'll just tell you, uh, I'm bad at it. I'll try to mess with my kids, just like joking around. You know, I'll say something like, yeah, hot dogs. It's actually hot dog meat that they smash together. You know, that's what the pound is for. That's why it's so cheap. And, but the moment that my kids look at, uh, look at me and they're like, are you serious? No, I'm not serious. I can't, I can't keep a straight face. I'm a bad liar. But I've met some skilled liars before. And that's a, that's a real spiritual thing. Uh, scripture tells us that our enemy is a liar. Satan himself, his demons, that's one of the weapons of spiritual warfare, is a skilled, well-placed lie. Many of us uh, fall for these because it's like 95% true, right? And it's just that little bit that's twisted. But today, the apostle John, God, through, through the power of the Holy Spirit, inspires John to remind us about a third category of liar, and that's somebody that is self-deceived. They're lying to themselves. And this might be the most dangerous type of liar because they truly believe what it is that they're saying. I told you last week that John is, God gave us the apostle John for a time like this because he's not afraid to speak hard truths 
He writes in black and white in a world of shades of gray. And John here is challenging us to confront the reality of our lives in light of the claims that we make. And there's good news with this, by the way. Those same psychological studies which tell you the more times you repeat a lie, the more often or or more, you know, you may tend to believe it. Those same studies, you know what they tell you can get you out of that? Consistently being confronted with the truth. That's the thing that fixes it. And so today is a challenge for all of us to allow ourselves to be confronted by the truth of God's word. Now, I want us to go through this passage again, verse by verse. And I want us to talk about it. Here's what we see in verse 5. John is writing, remember, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, this is the message that we have heard from him and we proclaim to you. Now, throw back to last week. If you weren't here, the first four verses is about John making a very specific claim that Jesus is God. He says that he is in the beginning with God. He is the word of God. He's the word of life. It's a specific claim. Jesus is pre-existent. He is the uncreated creator. And John is telling us, listen, I saw him. I looked upon him. I touched him. I heard him with my own ears. God himself said this, my testimony is true. And now today he is saying like, listen, you need to listen. This is the message that I heard from God. It's a heavenly echo. God himself spoke, and this is the message that we have heard. He says now, is kind of an interesting side note, that this is what I'm proclaiming to you. This is the third different time he uses that word proclaim in the first five verses. It's a big part of what it is that he's trying to get across to us. But something interesting happens. The first two times he uses the word that's translated as proclaim is in verses two and three. And that uses the Greek word apangelo. Why don't you go ahead and say that with me? So I know you're apangelo, apangelo. I don't know how to spell it. I forget, but I remember the word apangelo. But in verse five, he switches to a new Greek word, which is also translated into the English proclaim, but he picks a different word. He says anangelo right here. Now in verses two and three, apangelo, the emphasis is on the one who is making the proclamation. So he is saying I heard this, I saw this, we were witnesses, we were there. This is what we're proclaiming. But now in verse 5, the emphasis switches to the one who hears the proclamation. He's saying, you need to listen to what I have to say. And so today, I'm doing the same thing that the Apostle John is doing. This message is for you. It's not an accident that today is the day that you hear this message. It's for you. This may be the first time that you've been in church in months or years. The message is for you. You may be here seeking after God. This message is for you. You may be here completely skeptical about God. This message is for you. Grandma, grandpa, it's for you. You've been walking with God for years. John has a message for you. He's proclaiming this. And here is what he proclaims. I want you to pull out your phones. I want you to get out your notebooks. I want you to write this down. Here's the message that he is proclaiming. God is light. God is light. Jesus, God himself came down and this is what he revealed. God is light. Now, I'm not a scientist. I wasn't even particularly very good at science. So I can't explain to you like what physical light is, but that's, that's not what he's talking about here. This isn't a reference to like physical light that hits your eyeballs. What this is, it's, it's metaphorical language for moral perfection. In this case, light equals moral perfection. That's what that means. So when he says God is light, what he's saying is that that light is moral perfection. God is morally perfect. And he restates this. He says it for emphasis two different ways. He says, he says it in the positive first in verse five. He says, the message we heard from him, we proclaim to you, God is light. And then he says the exact same thing, but in the negative sense, in him is no darkness at all. How much darkness is in God? None. 
There is none. This is a morally perfect God. He is perfect in his holiness. He is perfect in his justice. There is no darkness in him. He is wholly other and different than we are. Now, this is an important message for the people that are hearing this as John is writing. Growing up in church, this is, you know, I was a kid that was in church like literally the next week after I was born. And so I grew up hearing like, yeah, God is perfect. God is good. There's no sin in him. But you have to understand, John is writing this in the city of Ephesus. He's in the middle of the Roman Empire. He is writing not in Jerusalem where all these people know about Yahweh, this monotheistic one God, this perfect God. He's writing in a place where they know the Greek gods. They know the Roman gods. It's the Roman Empire. And Ephesus itself is actually a center of Greek and Roman worship. There's this massive temple in the city of Ephesus. It's a temple of Artemis. People would make pilgrimages into Ephesus, these people to make sacrifices in this temple. Pagan worship was all over the place in Ephesus. And so John is sitting around and he's writing and he's saying, hey, the first thing that God wants to remind you of is that God is not like any of that. And I'll just give you some examples of some of these Greek gods and goddesses. I I picked four of them for you. The first one is Kronos. Now, this is Kronos. This is a a beautiful picture of him. He is a titan. He's the father of Zeus. That's why I picked him. He's a titan, not technically a god. But Kronos, when he was a kid, his mother convinced him to castrate his father with a scythe, a sickle, like what the Grim Reaper uses. No bueno. Now, he grows up and he's afraid that his kids will do something like that to him. So as soon as they're born, he eats them. This is Kronos. Now, Zeus tricks him into thinking that he was eaten. He goes and he hides. He grows up, and then Kronos' worst fears come true. Zeus comes back, kills him, and chops him up into a bunch of little pieces. And then there's Zeus. Let's talk about Zeus. If you've heard of the Greek god Zeus, raise your hand. I think this one, thank you, Disney. Most of us know about Zeus. Zeus is a notorious ladies' man. He is uh, married to a, another goddess. Her name's Hera. But Zeus, I'm telling you, he has tons of affairs. That's almost all of his stories. It's about he's having affairs with other goddesses. He's having affairs with lesser goddesses like nymphs. And he's having affairs with human women as well. This is Zeus. He's a lustful god. Now, Hera, his wife, she comes in after Zeus, and she's not mad at Zeus necessarily, but she punishes all the women that he has affairs with. And she punishes all of their offspring as well, making their lives and their futures miserable. Hera is the mother of many of the Greek gods and goddesses you might recognize, but she's not really a good mom. She has this one kid named Hephaestus, and she takes one look at this baby after she gives birth and she says, this baby is so ugly that I can't, I just can't look at him anymore. Now I've met some ugly babies. We don't have to pretend that all babies are cute. Some of them start out a little bit on the ugly side. Uh, But I've never once been tempted to do what Hera did. She just throws Hephaestus off of Mount Olympus. She just chucks him out the window. Now, he falls down to earth. Luckily, he survives, but he messes up his hip and he walks through his life with a limp. And then there's Artemis. She is the daughter of Zeus and uh, Hera. And Artemis has this temple in Ephesus, and I'm telling you, she is just as cruel and capricious and vengeful. She is a schemer. She, She makes humans do these awful things and their sacrifices. Famously, if you read the Odyssey, she makes the uh, king Agamemnon sacrifice his own daughter before she'll allow him to sail to the Trojan War. These Greek gods and goddesses are just like us, but like extra. They're on a 10. They're just like we are. They're lustful. They're greedy. They're vengeful. They take revenge. They're angry. They, they act on impulse. They, they're just like us, but with superpowers. And John is saying, the God that Jesus revealed is nothing like this. He is moral perfection. 
In him is no darkness at all. And we have to come to grips with that idea because the next part of this passage is really the crux of what we're talking about for the rest of the day. And this is verses six. We'll read six and then we'll, we'll come back to seven. In verse six, it says this. So if we say that we have fellowship with him, this God of moral perfection, while we walk in darkness or sin, we lie and we do not practice the truth. If we say that we have fellowship with a God of perfect moral perfection while we walk in darkness and in sin, we lie and we don't practice the truth. This comes to the heart of the matter, which is that I can claim that I have fellowship with God while I am walking in darkness. I can claim that I have fellowship with God while I'm walking in sin. In fact, let's be honest, we can claim whatever we want about whatever we want, but what John is saying is that your life actually will demonstrate the truth or the falsehood of what you actually believe. That's a hard truth. I mean, I can claim whatever I want. I can claim to you, hey, guys, I, I actually, I play football for the San Francisco 49ers. And I know you might think I'm on the small side. I'm a kicker. What can I tell you? Now, I can make that claim over and over, but what proves the truth of it is the fact that I'm here instead of in Las Vegas, right? The fact that I'm uh, living in my house that I'm living in instead of living out in San Francisco. The truth of the claims that we make is evidenced by our lives, and that's what John is calling us to do. And so listen to me. This is a warning for you. It's for you. Remember, John's message is for who? It's not for your neighbor. It's not for the person next to you. He's proclaiming this so that you would hear it. It doesn't matter what you say. You need to look and take a good hard look at the life that you live. And so for us as Christians, I can claim, so to be a follower of Christ means that I've made Jesus the Lord of my life. He's the Lord. I'm not the Lord anymore. He is. I recognize that I was walking in darkness, that I needed salvation. I couldn't get it on my own. So I make Jesus the Lord of my life. Now I can claim that Jesus is the Lord of my life, but ultimately, what if you look at my finances? Does that show that Jesus is the Lord of my life? Well, he's the Lord. He calls me to be consistent in my giving, consistently generous, consistently worshipful in my giving. So my bank account actually tells the truth of whether or not Christ is Lord. Let's take forgiveness. Jesus says that for those who have been forgiven much, we will forgive others. That's what we have to do. And so I say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. I accept your forgiveness. But am I walking in unforgiveness towards people who have harmed me, hurt me? Am I walking in bitterness and anger? Well, that shows that Jesus isn't actually the Lord of my life. It just goes on and on with your marriages, with your family, with the way you spend your time. How about the way that you love the church? The church is called Christ's bride. He loves it. He laid down his life for it. How do you love and serve the church? If Jesus is the Lord, there should be some correlation there. And these are the hard truths. This is the black and white that kind of makes us squirm in our seat a little bit. It forces us to confront it. And and listen, you can ignore this today, but what John says is that you're deceiving yourself. And so really, here's where it leaves us, church. Here's where it leaves us. Either one, I'm going to claim that I have fellowship with God while I'm walking in sin and darkness, and I'm going to hope that he doesn't notice it. Or two, I'm claiming that I have fellowship with God while I'm walking in darkness. Listen to me. But I don't actually know that I'm walking in darkness because I've deceived myself. Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 7 about this. He says that on the day of judgment, many will stand before him. And what will they cry out? Who knows? Lord, Lord. And Jesus will say, whoa, I don't know who you are. 
Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I don't know who you are. You might claim Lord, 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 but walk in the darkness. And this is why we're called to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That should make you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. I want to talk to three different types of people here today. Because I think that truly there's three sort of common types of people that we might run into when we're talking about this. The first is a person who uh, ultimately, listen now, ultimately this is a person who you live how you want. You drink what you want, you eat what you want, you spend your money how you want, you sleep with who you want, whenever you want, and you just claim, you know, God is with me. God's with me. God always seems to agree with you. You have rejected this perfect moral standard and you've said instead, you know what? I think I am that standard. God agrees with me. So the things that you love, God happens to love those things. The things that you don't like, God doesn't like those things anyway. God always agrees with you and you're not going to be confronted by this perfect moral standard. I think about this as like, I love the Olympics. Do any of you guys like watching the Olympics? Like I'm hype for this summer. I wish I was going to Paris to watch this, these games. I get into like all the, the lesser known stuff, badminton and ping pong. One year I was watching, I watched the whole archery competition from start to finish and that blew my mind. Like that, the bullseye is like that big. And these people hit it every stinking time. I bought a bow and arrow. I was like shooting in my backyard. My neighbor was getting nervous. I'd accidentally shoot his dog. It was... It's awesome. Now, I want you to imagine that competition with such skill, but they change the rules so that they take the target away completely. And here's what you do instead. You, you shoot that bow and arrow, you let it go. And then what you do is you grab your spray paint and you walk out to wherever that arrow lands and you just draw the bullseye right around it. Ultimately, that's how so many of us live our lives. I've ignored the standard that God has set. And instead, you know what? I'm going to shoot my shot and God's going to be with me. Here's a warning for you that John gives us in verse 8 and in verse 10. Here's what he says. If we say we have no sin, we deceive who? Ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we say there is no standard that I'm falling short of, all you are deceiving, the only person you deceive is yourself. And then in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his truth isn't in us. Listen, you can claim that you have no sin, but the only person that you deceive is yourself. Now there's good news for you. If this is the first time that you're hearing about that standard, we'll talk about that in just a moment. The second person is the person that grows up and you know all about the Bible stories. You know about the standard of God. You may even affirm that it's true. You've been in and around church your whole life. Maybe you had a parent or a sibling or a grandparent. You maybe even come to church week after week after week. You know all the answers, but it's not simply enough to know the answers. Here's what verse 7 tells us. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, that's with our church, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What this is saying is that it's not enough to know about the light, to know about God. We actually have to walk in the light. We have to know God. It's not enough to know about him, to walk recognizing that there is light, we have to walk in the light. Now, I want to make sure that I'm very clear about a point here. Crystal clear. This is, this is the most important thing. So if you are tired and you're ready to fall asleep, wake up right now. You can never walk so well in this life that you can get to God because of your good works. 
There's no amount of money that I can give to God. There's no amount of time that I can spend serving God. There's no amount of forgiveness that I can offer or mission trips that I can go on that will ever cause me to be able to walk in God's holy and perfect presence. Here is what scripture says. The amount of people who are righteous is exactly zero. There's one, God himself. There are none righteous. Not a single one of us walks in the light on our own skill or on our own uh, ability. All of us are born into sin and then we willingly commit sin. All of you guys just admitted earlier to being liars. You've lied, you've cheated, you've lusted, you've been greedy, you've been angry. All of us have this sin and this sin separates us from this perfect and holy God so that we are incapable of walking with him. It's not possible for a God who is perfect and just to leave sin, which is evil and rebellious against him, unpunished. That's not justice. And so we are in this helpless condition. Like the apostle Paul, he cries out, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin and death? The answer, of course, is Jesus Christ. Praise God for Jesus. Where I could not get to God, God came down to me. Jesus himself lived a perfect life, a sinless life. And what he chose to do was take the, the, the punishment that I deserve for my sin and that you deserve for your sin, the punishment the whole world deserves for our sinfulness and our rebellion and our rejection against him. Jesus took that upon himself. And what verse seven reminds us, is that it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all of our sin. God saw the sacrifice of Jesus and it was acceptable. The wages of my sin is death, but Jesus came in and he, he stepped into my place. He took my debts onto himself. He took my sins onto himself. He died so that I might have life. And this is why it matters so much, church. This is why this is good news for you who, are, who, are, who have been walking far from God. And this is why it's good news for you who have been around Christianity, but who have never actually surrendered your life. Jesus, Jesus makes it possible. Where it was once impossible, Jesus made it possible. Praise God for Jesus. It is not my own strength that allows me to walk in the light. It's simply the blood of Jesus. And that blood is available to any and all who would call upon his name. Verse 9 gives us the best news. If we will just confess our sins, if we'll admit that we need him, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness, church? All of it. All of my unrighteousness, past, present, and future, cleansed from me by Jesus Christ. I have been forgiven and redeemed. I've been born again. I've been made new. My past is gone. My future lies before me. Where once I walked in darkness, now I have access to the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ, and I can walk with him instead. And it is better by far to walk with Jesus than to walk in the darkness. Finally, I want to talk to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters of the King. For any of you who are walking for a season or a time in darkness, you have you've spent at least a part of your life where you, you recognize who Jesus is, you've surrendered your life to him, you know that your sonship, your daughtership, you are secure in that salvation. You recognize who God is, you've surrendered your life to him, but right now in this moment, you're not walking with him. I wanna to talk to you. It is, it is incredible good news that I have to share with you. It is that Jesus himself is just waiting for you to turn back. Sin in my life, I can walk in darkness. I can be saved and still choose to walk away from God. Now it doesn't affect my salvation. I couldn't earn that myself, but, but listen to me, church. 
It does affect my fellowship with God. Sin affects fellowship, doesn't it? I mean, think about any relationship that you have in your life. If they sin against you, if you sin against them, if they lie about you or stab you in the back or harm you, that affects that relationship until there's been reconciliation that's made. And so for you, if you feel like you are far from God right now, you know that he's your Lord and Savior, but you haven't been walking with him. Understand that sin in your life affects that fellowship with God. There's a reason that you feel that way. This is a call to look at your life. You have claimed that Jesus is Lord, and yes, he is, but what area of your life have you taken that back from him? Maybe it's a relationship that you know God doesn't want you to be a part of, and you're staying in it. Maybe at one point you surrendered your finances to God, but man, you, you've just clawed that back, and, and you know you're being disobedient with your money. There's so many different ways that we can walk away from God. But I want to tell you that one minute you can be walking far away from God and the next minute you can turn to him. Scripture says you can confess your sins and that he will be faithful and just to forgive him. All we have to do is confess our sins and repent and the fellowship with God is restored. You don't have to be saved again. You have a God who loves you and who is waiting for you. My friends, John is giving us both a warning and he's giving us encouragement in this passage. He's saying that there is a God of perfect, moral, just perfection. God is a God of moral perfection. There's no darkness in him all. He's, he's light. So if you claim that you're walking with him, your life will reflect that. And so today, maybe you have never acknowledged who God is and acknowledged that you're sinful. If you don't acknowledge it, you're, you're lying to yourself. You're sinful. Maybe you've been around church and Christianity for so long, you know all the answers, but you've never actually surrendered to him, surrendered your life, trusted in Jesus, placed your faith in him to forgive you for your sins and receive the grace of God. Or maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, but somewhere along the road, you got off the path. For all of us, the message is the same. Confess, repent, and turn to God. Receive salvation. Begin to walk with him and enjoy the joy and the peace that God offers. Would you guys pray with me this morning? God, I thank you for the truth of your word. It is hard, though. God, it's hard to take a look at my life and to see the ways in which I so often turn from walking with you to chasing after my own desires, my own sin, my own pride. Forgive me. God, I confess. I repent. I want to turn to you. I want to walk with you. I want you to be the Lord of my life, of my finances, of my marriage, of, of my children. Lord, of the way I spend my time, the way that I treat people and forgive. Jesus, I want to walk with you. Thank you for purchasing for me with your blood the ability to have salvation, to be made new. I know I could never have earned it on my own. I pray for these men and women, young people who are here in this room today, God. I don't believe that it's an accident for a minute that they're here. I just pray that no one in here would ignore that Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you knocking on their heart's door today. Convict us of our sin, Lord. May there be men and women, even now in this moment, who cry out to you and say, God, forgive me of my sin. I'm placing my faith and my trust in you for my salvation. God, there, may there be men and women even now who have who have been around the, the church and who know all the answers, but who have never jumped in with both feet and placed all their faith, hope, and trust in you. May that happen right now in this moment. And Lord, may there be restored relationships, restored fellowship with many of us as we confess our sins in the moments and the ways in which we have walked away. We want to be faithful. Lord, we worship you. You are worthy of it. 
We cry out to you and we love you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.